The previous two videos have given some insights into how proportional and integral work. This video will put these two insights together. So first a reminder, here's the loop structure that we're going to assume. We've demonstrated that proportional is effective at handling fast transients, but not asymptotic behaviour. Integral on its own will remove the steady state offset, but in general will lead to poor responses. Consequently, it's logical to combine the proportional and integral together. The proportional to deal with fast transients and the integral to deal with convergence and settling time. <coughs> and this will give us a compensator like this. Oops, is that gone? So M equals KP plus KI over S. The focus of this video is on simple or heuristic guidelines for tuning the pre-i parameters. We're not going to claim they're systematic. Uh, that will be uh, something for later videos. First then, a reminder of the proportional guidance. What have we shown? We've shown that if k, the proportional gain, is bigger than 1 over g of 0, <coughs> then the initial input is larger than the desired steady state, which implies relatively fast transient behaviour. If kp is less than 1 of g of 0, the initial input is smaller than the desired steady state, and that implies slow transient behaviour. And obviously, what's in the middle? If k equals 1 over g of 0, the initial behaviour is close to open loop dynamics. What about the integral? Well, in this case, we want to encourage students to think of precisely what the integral term is doing. <coughs> and what it's doing is integrating the error. Consequently, we can determine a very simple but insightful formula, which is the one given here. The limit as t goes to infinity of u of t is the integral term ki times a, where a is the integral from naught to not so much infinity probably, but you can put it there if you like, the, the asymptotic area of the error curve. That's what this term here is showing. And what's interesting here is you notice that the steady state value of the input has got a very simple formula, ki times a. Now, what does this tell you? It tells you that the area of the error curve, that's this capital A, multiplied by ki is a constant. So in other words, this term here, if I highlight it, this term is fixed. Once you fix ki, given that you're not going to have an asymptotic error if you have an integral, then the integral of the error curve is fixed as the same value no matter what you do. We'll use some examples to uh, make use of this. Here's a demonstration. You'll see we've given a response in this blue curve, and the red bit shows the area of the error curve. So if this blue bit is y, and this top line up here is r, then clearly this value in here is e equals r minus y. So the red shaded area is the integral of the error. Or if I write it in full, the integral of e dt, starting from naught to t. Now, if this area is going to get smaller, then ki has to get bigger because what we've decided is that ki times a is a constant. U steady state is fixed by the set point. So if we want the area to get smaller, this red area to get smaller, ki must be bigger. Or conversely, if ki is smaller, you choose a smaller value for the integral grain, then that area of the error curve must get bigger. And if that area is getting bigger, that means the response is getting slower. Here's an example to demonstrate how you can use this formula to give an indication of what sort of integral gain you want. So we've chosen a simple first order system, and there it is, g equals k over s plus st plus 1, and we've given the step response with it settling at a desired point uh, r, and you can see the r there, which is going to be 2.5. Now, because we know the shape of this error curve is approximately a first-order exponential, then we can show that the 
red area is given by this formula, R times T. You can see the values T down here on the um, x-axis, which correspond to this T in the model. And you can see where the value R is. So you can show that the area is approximately RT. For an exact first order system, it is in fact exactly RT. But we're assuming that the first order system is a close approximation. Having done that, we can say, well, actually, we also know that U steady state equals Ki times A. That was the previous slide. And in the previous videos, we've also shown that U steady state is R over G of zero. So we've got two identities now that we can use and we can combine with this identity here. Where does that, what does that give us? Let's just move that box so we can see. It gives us <coughs> this answer here. That one, how does it do that? One over T G of zero equals Ki. So if you can't see quite where that's come from, cross that A there, write RT. So you've now got R over G of 0 equals KRT. Cross the R's. And now you can see 1 over G of 0 equals KIT, or KI is 1 over T G of 0. So what's this telling you? If you want an error curve, a bit like the red shaded one here, so with a time constant capital T, then you must set the integral time constant, or sorry, the integral gain, to be 1 over t g of 0. So a summary of the heuristic guidance. We've said what the integral time constant should be. There it is, 1 over t g 0. In the previous video, we've shown that the proportional gain, if you want roughly open loop dynamics, is given by this, 1 over g of 0 equals kp. If we put those two together, this gives us our PI compensator as 1 over G of 0 into 1 plus 1 over ST. And you'll notice there's a very nice structure there. G of 0, something to do with the process, and T, the time constant that you want. Now, the heuristic design is used as an indicator of expected values, but not necessarily as a final design. Nobody's saying this is perfect, but we're saying if you put these values in, it's likely to be close to what you want for a simple model. If you increase the proportional, it means you want a faster response than open loop. And so the relative size of the proportional compared to this guideline is an indicator of the speed up or overactuation that you're going to get. If you want a faster settling time, you also require a smaller t and a larger kp. In general, you don't really want the settling time to be a lot faster than the open loop time because you'll need a lot of overactuation and you'll get other limits which could give you problems. So generally speaking, I wouldn't recommend that you make that t too small. But here's an example of what you would need if you wanted to speed up by two. And you look at that and you say, golly, isn't that a simple formula? All I've done is put a 2 outside the front. So I've got 2 over g of 0 into 1 plus 1 over st. And again, we will indicate that with the examples to follow. <coughs> so here's the first example. You notice we've given g of s as 20 over 5s plus 1. And what we're saying is we're going to use t equals 5 because that matches the open loop. Now, if you're wondering why there's lots of different plots what we've done is we've said the nominal model is 20 over 5s plus 1, but we're going to try our controller with various different models, which are not exactly 20 over 5s plus 1, but vary a little bit. So we move the time constant a little or move the gain a bit, just to get an idea of whether the controller we've chosen is robust. We've used the uh, heuristic design. So the controller is 1 over g of 0 into 1 plus 1 over st, where we've chosen t equals 5, and g of 0, in this case, is 20. So that's our, our compensator design. And what can you see? Well, you can see all the responses are pretty close to the first order response that we want with a relevant time constant. All very nice, even with this uncertainty. And if you look at the inputs, u, what can you see? 
they're all very close to a step. No overactuation, not particularly. Any any slight over or underactuation is more to do with the uncertainty than anything else. And in fact, if you look at this blue line in the middle, you'll see it's a perfect step. And that corresponds to when there was no uncertainty. So if you choose this PI with a first order model, then you can replicate first order behavior exactly, which is quite nice. So there's a summary. We've got a good dynamic uh, for this first order model. And the closed loop input is close to a step, which means no overactuation, open loop dynamics, nice and safe. What happens if we want to do some speed up? So what we've done in this particular example is we've said we want t equal to 2.5. So we've simply applied a 2 outside our formula. And if you look at the responses here, you'll say again, look, very nice first order responses. You can see the time constants about two and a half, exactly as we expect. We look at the inputs and we notice, yeah, OK, the initial value is twice as big as the steady state, exactly as you would expect because you're trying to get a fast transient behavior. But thereafter, it's nice and smooth as it goes to the steady state. So what we've got is this heuristic design seems to be working quite effectively for a simple model. What happens then if you have a second order example? Well, this heuristic design was based upon a particular error curve where the error curve was based on a first order type of response. So if you've got a first order model, you find the integral of the area is approximately RT and you can use this value as the choice of Ki and it's fairly effective. If you've got an over damped second order system, and you know what time constant you want, you'll notice you can get away with using the same sort of formula. However, if you've got a critically damped second order system, then you find the integral of the error is somewhat different because you get this sort of S-shaped curve, which we called, talked about in the previous video. And therefore, you need to reduce the value of Ki, otherwise you're going to get a few problems. And we'll demonstrate that with the next example. Here's a second order example you'll see with critical damping. And we've used the default design for the heuristic. So we've used k equals 1 over g of 0 into 1 plus 1 over st, where the time constant we've chosen is going to match the open loop. So it'll be this 1.4. And you look at that and you say, well, the ideal response, which is this dashed blue curve, that's the one we were sort of looking for. We're not particularly close to that. We seem to have overreacted and oscillated a tiny bit. And why might that be? <coughs> and we look down here at the inputs and we notice, look, the initial input's correct. That's at the correct steady state. But after that, we've gone up. Now, why is that? Well, the reason is that if I do a sketch to remind you, the response has got this sort of classic type of S shape at the start and therefore the area that you're getting out of the integral in the early transients is growing much more rapidly than you would get with a first order curve. And that's what you see over here with the input. The input is going up rather than staying roughly flat. And that explains why in the table on the previous slide, we would suggest if you've got a second order example, you'll probably, instead of using the, um, the heuristic we've got here, so that's the design we've used. You might well decide, I'm going to put an extra 2 down there in the denominator just to reduce the integral gain a bit so it doesn't integrate up quite so quickly. OK, so conclusions. We've presented a heuristic PI design based on understanding key process attributes of steady state gain and a desired closed loop time constant. It works well with first order processes, but gives an integral gain that's slightly high for second order processes. However, here's the key point. It will be clear to you that this is a heuristic design. It gives you a ballpark figure for where the P and the I maybe should be, but it's no way systematic. And we need some more sophisticated and systematic tools to do effective control design, and they will be covered in later videos.